Welkom bij Big Talk. Rotterdam is tien dagen lang helemaal in de ban van films en iedere avond vindt hier in het oude Luxor een talkshow plaats. Daarin zetten we top interviewers tegenover de belangrijkste gasten van het festival. Vanavond spreekt Patrick van Meel van het Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam met Lech Majewski die een film maakte over Breugel, The Mill and the Cross. My painting will have to tell many stories. It should be large enough to hold everything. I will work like the spider I saw this morning, building its web. First, it finds an anchoring point. Here, the heart of my web. Our savior is being browned mercilessly. In most paintings, God is shown parting the clouds, looking down on the world in displeasure. In my painting, the miller will take his place. He is the great miller of heaven, grinding the bread of life and destiny. Welcome. Welcome. It was 11 years ago that you were here? Yes, yes, feels like yesterday. Yes, there hasn't been changed that much around well, there. We're always staying in Hilton, and okay. now it's Manhattan. No, only 300 meters. Yes. Okay. Uh, there are made a lot of movies, biopics, about painters. You made a movie about one single painting. Yes. What made you do this? <laughs> the love for Bruegel, or as you say, Bruegel. Bruegel, we Bruegel. say Bruegel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> I will stay with Bruegel. <laughs> okay. That's how it. That's okay for tonight. No, I loved him from my early days as a teenager. I traveled from an industrial city of Katowice to my uncle, who was teaching at Venice Conservatory. And uh, he was gracious of giving me in the summer his, his house in Venice. So I always stayed in Vienna for a day to switch trains. And I always went to Saal 10 in Kunsthistorische Museum. And for some reason, I spent a lot of time in front of Bruegel. Uh, he sort of sucked me in, in his world. I was. I felt him in my mouth. I don't know how to say it. Uh, these people, these characters, the stories that he was telling, the, the philosophy that he was presenting himself uh, was one big uh, lesson and friendship, I guess. I mean, you can generate a friendship. Uh, he is inviting you in. Many artistic objects of today don't invite you in. He does invite you in. A lot of old masters invite you in. They settle a space for you that you can travel into and you can live in that space. And uh, when uh, my film Angelus uh, was played in Paris, uh, uh, a very famous art historian, American in Paris, Michael Gibson, he saw my movie, wrote a very good review, and uh, asked me to meet him because he thinks my imagination is Bruegelian. So <clears throat> he wrote this book, this essay, analyzing one single canvas of Bruegel, The Way to Calvary, and he gave this book to me, and I read it in one go. I found it extremely fascinating. I read a lot of books on painting in my life because I am a painter. I started my life as a painter and a poet. But this one was uh, beautifully written and the, the, the travel that he proposed through the symbols, through the hidden language that Bruegel is using in creating his world, that, that the left side of the painting is, is the area of life because uh, you have the tree that has leaves 
and the right side of the painting is the area of death, and you have a naked tree which serves for the wheel that people are put on top of it, and there is a space for Golgotha. And the way this sky changes from the left to right, the left side of the sky is bright and beautiful, and the right side of the sky is murky and uh, ominous and very dark. Uh, the way he positions the rock, the way he repeats the holy family in the rock formation, the way, I mean, so many cues and so many interesting, I felt almost like a de detective following the little uh, cues that were given to me. And so I read his book, I came to Paris, we had lunch, and I said, listen, this is a fantastic book. And he said, well, I'm glad because I, I would like you to do an educational movie, a documentary. And with me standing in front of the painting and explaining the things. And I said, well... The traditional way. Yeah. I said, that's not my field, but let's do a feature film based on your book. And he, uh, he held his head, I remember, and said, you must be crazy. I mean, there is no possibility of making a feature based on an art essay. And I said, that's exactly what is exciting about it. Let's try to do it. The impossible is always exciting. And uh, we started, as Americans say, kick around a few things. First of all, we said, look, there are human beings in this painting. There are Five hundred. Eh? Yeah, Five hundred of them. Yeah. So let's select it a dozen of them, and let's tell their lives on a single occasion that they are the subjects of Bruegel masterminding plan of showing the philosophy of the times. What I respect also in those artists, in the artists from the past, is that they were brave enough to try to co com combine the entire knowledge of the world in a single piece of work. So, if you look at the old masters, there's a compendia of the knowledge. It's also mm -hmm. like Dante and the Divine Comedy. It's, it's a compendium. It's, it's, you know, if you look at the book, it's not that thick. Mm -hmm. But it has the absolute total knowledge of the given time and contains the entire world, the up and down, and left and right, and you know, every aspect you could imagine. But how, how did you come to transfer this into a, a fiction film or a narrative movie because it's all symbolic and you say it's like like a book and a documentary you can explain but you don't explain in your film how did you come about well i think that films need a mechanism of interest that the, the, the film that can pull in the audience has to repeat a certain mechanism uh, that is natural for the psychology of of human beings, like for example, the criminal story um, relies on your um, curiosity, who done it. Uh, let's say Western relies on your sense of justice, that the bad guys will finally get it, no matter how hard it will come for the good guy. But the ultimate effect is the justice wins. We know it doesn't happen in the real life, but we want it on the screen, just to feel satisfied. Uh, the other situation, obviously, I felt is when you sp spy on something, when you see only fragments of things, and you just peep in, peeping Tom. Mm -hmm. um, and that ar uh, arouses your cu curiosity. It makes you extra interested, and sort of your imagination started to, to flow. And the other I found is the process of creation. Uh, if you take any kind of a painter who publicly paints or sketches something, you always see a bunch of people stuck to his back and watching him doing it. Mm -hmm. So there is a genuine curiosity there. And I figure if I was stuck in the back of Bruegel and hear him mumbling what the keys, the cues, the, the directions of how to understand the painting, that would be... Um, something that maybe the audience will take on as well. Did you identify with, with Breugel for this film? Did you, like you? Well, 
I mean, I, I, I consider Bruegel one of the biggest philosophers. I mean, his way of looking at things, that he's always hiding the most, this, the main subject. Yeah. Like the f well, because I had the idea that uh, maybe this movie is more a painting than a movie. And that what I mean is that uh, nowadays th this picture of Bruegel is so rich of stories and of, of uh, icons and symbols. You try to involve it, involve eh, and fold them in your in your movie. When people should have the patience to look at it in a museum, one hour and a half, but they don't do it anymore. But now you're giving the story in a film theater. It's a kind of translation of the work for the contemporary public. Could be. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's one of the possible yeah. interpretations. What else could it be? Well, you know. Uh, the Bruegel philosopher, I mean, what I was always amazed by is the, the shock that I lived with when I saw his fall of Icarus. Uh, you know, you see a fall of Icarus and you don't see Icarus in the painting. You just see all sorts of daily lives. Like you see the shepherd with the flock of sheep and you see a fisherman fishing and you see a, a countryman plowing the field and uh, you see a ship sailing and you... Sh and you just look for this Icarus, and in the end you find this little leg sticking out of the water. So, you know, the guy does it 500 years ago. What a brilliant mind, what a brilliant attitude towards the subject. Mm -hmm. I mean, he tells you on various layers, many very realistic interpretations and, and philosophies. First of all, he tells you that the daily life, daily routine, will be always more important to people than the most dramatic events. Furthermore, if the mythological event is happening, the day you won't see it, because your daily routine will cover it up. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this is fantastic. This is, you know, 500 years before Orson yeah. Welles and that, Citizen Kane. No, that's true, that's true. You also work with Hieronymus Bosch, now with Breugel again. Does that has to do with, some, with the Catholic roots that are so strongly uh, present in, in Poland? Well, it's a broad subject, you know. I know. I, uh, I think this story is religious in a very strange way because you have the Catholic people coming to Protestant people, yeah. considering them heretics and crucifying them to make them Catholic. I mean, only human beings can think up things like that. <laughs> I mean, sick people. So, it's interesting because it's a catch-22 in a way. It's mm -hmm. sort of like, um, you know, thing that rolls on itself. It's like a snake that eats its own tail. I mean, yeah. Ouroboros. Okay. I mean, this is a strange thing, but it's there. Okay. In your work, you uh, often work with, with uh, artistic products, as I may say so, artistic works of other artists from the past and also uh, recent artists? I do like to visit them, yeah. as but opposed I... to cops and killers and yeah. other guys. I okay, mean, I can learn a lot from cops and killers. But when, when, I, when I look, for instance, we look at this picture, is this, let's say, 90% Breugel, 10% Lech Majewski, or is it the other way around? Well, I never looked at it this way. <laughs> I feel completely, um, I think he's a master and I just love him and uh, okay. respect him tremendously and uh, I just try to do my job, which, you know, be, mm -hmm. he is the host, I am the guest, so, uh, you know, I drink my tea and talk with him. <laughs> okay. I figure I need to create his space. So what we did is, first of all, we painted out human beings from his painting. Mm -hmm. And then we analyzed it with the computer. And we figured out that this is not a singular perspective that he's proposing, but he's proposing like seven perspectives. So obviously, he walked around and did sketches. And once he was assembling them into a canvas, he married the sketches together. He saw them together. 
Also, Bruegel once in his life traveled through Alps to Italy, and he was so fascinated, the men from the flatlands, suddenly seeing this shouting, exploding rocks. I mean, that he made millions of drawings of this, and when he returned from his Italian trip, he introduced those rocks in his paintings, which is totally uh, uh, alien to this landscape that, uh, that we have here. And obviously these rocks become, in the language of the past, also the sacred body and the cracks in the rock, it means the wounds, and so on and so on. Uh, but we had to create that landscape, so we couldn't just go and film any landscape. We just went with little diaphragms made of these seven frag fragments, and we went to Czech Republic and to Poland and to wherever, and we were looking where we can find a landscape like this, and we found it. 